Okay, so we are in the Gospel of John chapter 5. Last time we finished studying chapter 4, so today we're chapter 5 beginning verse 1. I'm reading from the New King James Translation if you want to follow along. The Gospel of John chapter 5 verse 1. After this there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there was in, in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethsaida, I mean, excuse me, Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water, that whoever, then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there, and he knew that he already had been in that condition for a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred. But while I'm coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Rise, take up your bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed, and walked. And that day was a Sabbath. Therefore the Jews said to him who was cured, It is a Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. He answered them, He who made me well said to me, Take up your bed and walk. Then they asked him, Who is the man that said to you, Take up your bed and walk? But the one who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn a, multiple, a multitude being in that place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you've been made well. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. You know, this, this is the beginning of a great chapter, uh, and it might have been even considered a turning point for, for Jesus' ministry uh, in a certain ways. Um, it actually is somewhat of a turning point for our instruction here. Uh, and up, up till now, we've seen quite a few examples of, of how to witness to people using Jesus' example. And in a lot of things, we, we learned uh, up through now many things that lay a firm foundation for the authority of Scripture, specifically the Gospel of John, for the divinity of Christ, for the historical accuracy of the Bible, uh, the condemned state of mankind, and the possibility of redemption for man. And even to, even the unique um, one to, and even, <laughs> I'm trying to read my own writing, I can't read it. <laughs> but, uh, oh, the only unique way for us to be redeemed from the sin and sickness of sin in our lives and in the world. We've learned all of that up through in the first four chapters. We've watched how people in different ways have decided to follow Jesus, different life circumstances, how people in different statuses in the community and people with different religious beliefs and people with various intellectual backgrounds. And although each is unique in their own ways and in their own uh, life circumstances, they all need Jesus, and God offers every one of them the opportunity to receive eternal life. We've also studied the contrast between light and darkness, good and evil. We've seen that God detests evil, and that his son, Jesus, is willing to stand up against all odds to clean out corruption and sin from even worship of God and from the lives of those who truly want to do what's right. And even though it might seem obvious that people would want to choose good and light, many do not make the right choices because they love darkness because of their evil deeds and self-righteousness more than they love the light and good. We've also read of how Jesus had love and compassion for the people that he met in all circumstances and even though sometimes he had truths to share with them that were hard truths, he always did it with grace first then presented the truth and allowed a response from people. And finally, so far we've had a front row seat to some miraculous signs and wonders and miracles. Now these weren't done as a showcase to draw attention to the signs themselves or even to Jesus himself, but rather the expression and willingness of our Heavenly Father to, be, to generously bestow blessings upon us no matter what situation we're in because he loves us. And Jesus was always pointing to give glory to the Father. So as we've studied through this point, we've also seen a number of layers of, of belief. 
such as the one we just read about in, in today's text, um, about bringing a, a belief in Jesus, a true belief, a trusting faith. Um, we, we read about that or remind ourselves over and over that you know, we are to believe in, trust in, and hear to, cling to Jesus. It's not just believe that he exists uh, because we know that even the demons do that and, and they don't even like that he exists. But at first, we may think, when we look at signs and wonders and different miracles, at first you may think that the more people see miracles, the stronger and quicker they'll believe the truth of the gospel. I mean, that almost makes sense that, oh, if I say, you know, one miracle, you know, then two miracles is even better. You know, we think bigger is always better, more is better. But that's not the case. There's actually a problem with more signs. People get used to the miracle. They get used to the signs and wonders. And then the next time they demand more and bigger signs and wonders. And soon they'll become dissatisfied if they don't get bigger and better all the time. You know, the first thing we saw in this, this, cha this book was in chapter 2, Jesus turns the water into wine. Something nobody had ever done before in the history of mankind instantaneously caused water to be turned into wine for a feast because his friend was running, running short on this, uh, this drink for the festival. And people were amazed and they believed and they started following him. But they wanted to see more. In the last chapter, we saw that he not only knew the intents and heart of, of the heart of the Samaritan woman, but also told her many things that she had done in her life without ever having met her before. You know, that was another level of the miraculous. Uh, then he was back at the same place where he turned the water into wine. People there were following him, wanting to see something amazing. This nobleman rides up to him with his entourage. Hey, come back and heal my son. He's about to die. And they're thinking, oh, this guy's going to go and heal this guy and this would be cool to see and at that point Jesus instead of responding to his request he said you know you guys are always looking for signs and wonders and you're just not going to believe are you <laughs> and so he kind of chastised them for that um, in today's text we see that Jesus merely heals a man that has been lame for 38 years and you know what he gets a lot of heat for that um <laughs> And, you know, the heat is from the religious people, not from normal <laughs> of non or non-religious or, or everyday people. But, you know, it just doesn't seem to make sense. But here's a heads up. Generally, this is great to, to understand as you're sharing Jesus, when you're sharing your faith with other people. Generally, if someone refuses to believe, they can see a thousand miracles in front of their own eyes and they're not going to believe still. Because, or they're not going to admit to it at least, because there's a deeper problem inside their hearts. And if someone does want to believe, like the nobleman did in the last chapter, all he needs to do is to hear the word of God as it applies to him, and he will believe it and he will benefit from it. So just keep that in mind. You never know what type of person you're talking to, so go ahead and share your faith with everybody you can and let God sort it out. <laughs> if someone responds negatively, that's not you. That's them. Our life lesson is hear the word of God, believe the word of God, and be blessed. Hear the word of God, believe the word of God, and be blessed. You usually don't want to, you don't take that long as intro before hitting the verse by verse, but uh, we kind of making a turn in the, in the book here, so I wanted to kind of review what we did. So, verse 1. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, the feast referred to here is people think they know what it is, but we really don't, aren't told for sure. It could be the Passover, could be Purim, could be Pentecost. But at this point, I'll just say, I'll admit, I don't know. But I do notice that the gospel writer once again calls it a feast of the Jews rather than a feast of the Lord. We know there are seven main feasts, festivals in the, the Hebrew scriptures. And uh, God always called them the Feast of the Lord. But now the Gospel writer is calling some of these a Feast of the Jews. And I think it reveals a lot about what the time, that the time was right for Jesus to come and to tell the absolute truth about the kingdom of God, teach people the ways of the Father, and, and not to follow their own traditions and to follow their own ways. 
And in, in, our, in our text, we already see that the religious leaders were telling them, telling this man that he had violated the law. Well, the law was not God's law. It was a law that they had put in place, thinking they were doing God a favor by explaining his law more. So uh, something else we see here, it says Jesus went up to Jerusalem, which again is geographically correct. Jesus went up. He went not north, but he went up in elevation to Jerusalem. Verse 2, now there is in Jerusalem uh, by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. Now, just to get an idea, this is a pool. This is, this is really there. <laughs> we call it now call it the Pool of Bethesda. It was organized, though, 800 years before Christ. There was a dam built that was across the, the Beth Zeta Valley, and it, the, the water ran into a reservoir, and it was collected for rainwater. And they had a, one of these sliding um, gates that controlled the water going in and out, so they could, they could determine how much water was in there and how much... You know, it was not, so they can control that. Um, and it's a place you can visit in Israel today. The name Bethesda now means, or we, we look back and it means in Hebrew, house of mercy or house of grace. They didn't call that when they first made it, but it does seem appropriate since the location see, is now seen as a place of grace due to the granting of healing from time to time for those we read about in verse 3, which says, In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whosoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Again, I have so many questions here <laughs> on this verse. I have pretty much no answers. There's been a lot of speculation about the pool. Some think it may have been water that had healing mineral properties in the water itself. But <clears throat> to me, it's very unlikely since it would have to have the properties all the time, not just once in a while when they thought an angel stirred the water. The healing was instantaneous, not over time like what would occur from, uh, from minerals in water. Uh, we went to hot springs, Arkansas, and they had you know, a whole industry of, of healing hot mineral water that came out of the mountainside, and it didn't even cure people instantly um, of anything. And also, uh, a pharmaceutical does not cure things instantly, um, and they don't cure everything. So from the account here, it says it would heal anything that was wrong with the person. So as you may have noticed, I'm, I'm a person that tends to think, try to think things out a little bit logically, a little bit factually, and, and check things out, seeking the truth and wherever I can find it. But guess what? When you have that mindset, there are just some things you have to take on the face, simply implying, I mean, simply trusting the truth of something because of the person that told it to you. And there's no other way to, when there's no other way to confirm or deny it. Now, in this case, uh, and I, I want to, the reason I, I mention that is because you, we've all met people that say, I won't believe it unless I see it. And I'm not going to have faith in something I can't see and prove. Well, that's just not true. Everybody has faith and belief in things they've never seen, they never will see, never have seen, and cannot. But they have to take the word of somebody they trust in that. And so this is kind of the process I go through, and maybe it'll help you when you're trying to figure out, should I believe this or should I not? Uh, now I will say if it's on Facebook, don't believe it. <laughs> okay, number one, I've not found references or differing explanations of this particular item from other scriptures or from reliable historical records. So you search those things out. Number two, there are no scriptural or historical accounts that actually contradict this. So there's nothing saying this did not happen the way it was said. Number three, this is consistent with the nature of the compassionate Father God that we've already seen. So in this case, it passes that test too. Number four, there's no indication of any of the gospel writers' contemporaries that disputed this account. So when he wrote this, the people were, that were 
at the pool were still alive and they, they could say, hey, that's just not true and, and dispute it right away. That did not happen. And number five, the person who's giving the account, in this case, the Apostle John, has given and continues to give accurate, reliable information without embellishment or er errors, whether the information is viewed as positively or negatively by the reader. So, he, you know, it's like he doesn't care whether they believe it or not. He's just writing what he knows to be true. So some, again, some may ex say that accepting the Bible is, as truth is blind faith. But when you look at these things logically and realistically, it's not blind faith. But it is still faith. Okay? So our life lesson at this point is to trust in the Word of God. Excuse me. Trust in the Word of God is not blind but is based on overwhelming evidence of truthfulness of the author that results in a strong, active, and unwavering, unwavering faith. Easy for you to say. Trust in the Word of God is not blind, but is based on overwhelming evidence of the truthfulness of the author that, gives, that results in strong, active, and unwavering, unwavering faith. If I try that a third time, I'd probably get it. <laughs> Let me go to verse 5. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. <clears throat> 38 years. I'm guessing this guy was probably the oldest guy there. Everybody knew him. Everybody knew his situation. And obviously nobody else cared that was there about this man and his situation. I mean, there's a multitude of sick people there focusing on and waiting for that water to move. He may have been one of the few people that actually looked up at the people that were coming through. I mean, this was the sheep gate. This is where sheep were, were taken into the, to the temple to be approved by the temple uh, priests and all for, for them to make a sacrifice. And, um, you know, a number of people coming in, mostly religious people, obviously, religious people. And so they were focused on the water, not on the people. This guy probably was looking at Jesus. And since we already know what's going to happen, I'll add in this life lesson. Look to Jesus first when you need help. Not to yourself, not to others, not even to angels sent by God. Look to Jesus first when you need help. Not to yourself, not to others, <clears throat> not even to angels sent by God. Verse 6, when Jesus saw him lying there, and he knew he'd already been in that condition for a long time. He said to him, do you want to be made well? <laughs> well, Jesus knew all about this guy, both naturally and supernaturally. Um, he'd been sick, maybe even laying by that pool, longer than Jesus had been on earth as a human. Jesus probably saw him dozens of times. And it's likely... From what we've read in verse 14, it's likely that this man's infirmity was caused by his own sin. Which may explain why nobody wanted to help him. It's like, he got himself in that situation, he can get himself out. We're not told exactly what the infirmity was, but that's kind of the implication. So why was now the time, if Jesus had seen him dozens of times before, why was now the time for Jesus to ask him this? It could be that Jesus had asked him this before, and maybe he'd gotten some mean answers or smart aleck answers. You know, I, this is another one of those guys you want to meet when you get to heaven. Hey, I'm the lame man that was in the pool of Bethesda. <laughs> Great, I want to ask you, what were you like? Um, you know, did Jesus ask you before, do you want to be made well? And you said, what do you think, stupid? I mean, you, know, you don't know what his response would have been. Like, I'm laying here on my bed, I've been here for years. What do you think? I don't know, it may have been smart enough. It may have been the first time they had an interaction. I, I don't know for sure. He, maybe he was discouraged or despondent and he didn't even care anymore. But actually, I kind, of, I kind of have to rule that out because he was there by the healing pool. He was hoping to get in someday. And honestly, there were probably better places in Jerusalem to hang out than with a multitude of other, other sick people. So let's look at verse seven. The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. It's interesting that the man still doesn't answer the question if he wants to be well. But instead, he explains why he can't be well. It's almost like a rehearsed speech. It might be the same thing he's telling everybody else that's passing by, uh, hoping that someday someone will have compassion on him and help put him in. Do we, do we know people like that? You ask them, 
how are you doing or how can I help you? And they explain all the bad things that are wrong and why they can't fix it and why you can't fix it. Well, the sick man does the same thing that nearly all of us do from time to time. And he put limits on God's help of his own ideas that might happen. And he doesn't think beyond his own personal experience. He's thinking, well, the only way I can be made well is to get in this pool at the right time and I can't do it and nobody's helping me. Well, our life lesson again here is that when Jesus asks you something, don't give excuses as to why it's not possible. Just answer him and expect a miracle. When Jesus asks you something, don't give excuses as to why it's not possible. Just answer him and expect a miracle. Sometimes we complain over and over about our situation. We enforce all the things that God does not do for us. And you find yourself caught up in that type of reinforcement cycle. Don't just sit there in your own misery for 38 years like this man did. Look to Jesus because he wants to set you free. He wants to break those chains that you're bound by in that cycle. And we see him literally smash this man's old way of life in verse 8. Jesus said to him, rise, take up your bed and walk. Jesus simply speaks to a man that is lame, actually tells him something that almost seems cruel to him at the time. I'd imagine that such a command would get a lot of dirty looks from the people around him. Uh, you know, a little scorn uh, from those that are sick, maybe even started laughing at Jesus' words. I mean, this guy's crazy. Can't he see he's lame? <laughs> maybe the man himself thought that. But um, we, we think that they may have been thoughts of belief that this man had because uh, Jesus spoke with authority. And uh, so, you know, God is, is working in his life, but he's not sure how that's going to play out. The important part, though, is that he obeyed Jesus' command. And we see in verse 9, it says, And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed, and walked. Wow. I seriously doubt that this man saw this coming. Okay. I don't know what he expected. He probably didn't know what to expect. But he honestly didn't know who Jesus was. So uh, on the faith and... and, and uh, on a belief level from you know zero to ten his was a zero or from one to ten it was probably a zero because he had no idea who this guy was uh, he may have gotten up when he did just to show this guy that he was indeed lame and he couldn't do it look maybe he was ready to say look my legs aren't working and all of a sudden they were working uh, we don't know the important thing, what's really important, is that he did what he was told to do by the Lord. And the Lord blessed him in an incredible way by healing his body and restoring him. You know, it said he was made well. There's nothing, definitely nothing lame about this man now. He got up, packed up his bed, which is probably akin to what we think of today as a, a thick, heavy-duty sleeping bag, and he walked, maybe for the first time in 38 years. He had to have been ecstatic. The sick and lame multitudes now are now taking notice that this guy that's been waiting here for decades and now standing up, is now standing up, walking around, even carrying his bed. It wasn't just the other sick and lame that noticed that he was carrying his bed. Okay, as we read in some of these verses that, actually I'm not gonna go into that this week, we're gonna pick that up next week, uh, next time as, uh, into those details but again we see that Jesus had love and compassion on a man that nobody else cared for nobody else seemed to care for or at least the man didn't think so and by the state of his body not being healed not having been moved to the pool at the right time uh, probably didn't have somebody advocating for him Jesus was there for him you know people are always trying to figure out that magic formula of what they should do to get favor from God do you need to believe is your faith strong enough? How much do you need to believe? Do you have, you have to believe the right thing about the right verse at the right time? You have to say the right words in a certain way. Are you praying hard enough and long enough? Are you saying the right words when you're praying? Is someone else praying for you? How are they praying for you? Are they using the right words when they're praying for you? 
Um, is there something else you need to learn before God will ch touch something in your life? Do you, you know, he's, he's trying to teach you a lesson that you haven't learned yet. And that's why you're not receiving what you're hoping to receive from him. I mean, all these things we think about and go through our mind and through our hearts. And you know what? You ready for this? There is no magic formula. There is no magic formula. Physical health, financial wellness, material gain, sometimes even the strength of your faith is not what it's important. It's important that God does what he wants to do, when he wants to do it, and no matter what his actions and desires are for us, it's best for us to see that in that old gospel song, trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Next week, uh, a little shorter than usual here. I hear some amens. <laughs> my, but my guess is that uh, in addition to those that were there sick and needing Jesus' help, which I believe he probably attended to a number of people that day, probably so much that we, we'd see in the verses following that he had withdrawn from the multitude. Why do you withdraw from a multitude? Because they're basically on top of you, attacking you, and you, you get worn out from them. Um, and yes, Jesus was human, but he withdrew. But there's other people that were watching. And next week we'll study um, and find out, honestly, who is really lame in this situation. Um, probably hadn't thought about that that way before, have you? So we just, uh, we thank you for being here. Thank you for taking the time to uh, spend in, in the Lord's presence today. Hope he's spoken to your heart and I know he'll bless you. God bless you.